representatives of the new democracy. This is a political disaster, uh, let alone an economic and social one. This is a political disaster. I don't want to get into the business of judging intentions, but Tsipras acted, in effect, as a political hitman here. He carried, he carried people's hopes through a rough and agonizing six-month period when uh, he formed the first government, even won a referendum, giving him the mandate to say no to blackmails, and then smashed these hopes to pieces. He signed, he signed the third uh, bailout, legitimizing, that's the worst thing, he legitimized the previous two uh, bailouts, and then with an express election, before implementing new harsh austerity, before people have a chance to feel its effect on their lives, right after the summer holidays, and this is significant, he went and stole the popular vote. The resulting parliament is pretty much like the old one, you know, like the one we started with. The only difference is that he kicked out, the, uh, he kicked out of the parliament every Syriza MP who voted no to the bailout. This is the effect. Um, these, were not, these, were, these were the only people with an actual realistic government program besides capitulation and more austerity. The Greek elections of September 20th took place so that the no vote of 62% of the Greek people is evicted from parliament. Now, what I warned against uh, right before the election, the, the Weimar Germany analogy is now is in full development, um, naturally. We had a record rate of abstention. 45% of the people didn't bother to go and vote. This may seem normal for an American, but we're talking about Greece where abstention um, was, in older times, was under, under 10%. And was, mm -hmm. at the 2004 election, it was 24%. The, and this time around, 45%. This is huge. And the absent were primarily discouraged voters who see no point in elections, see no point in politics. Because if there's no alternative, what's the, the point in politics? Most of these people, according to statistics, are people in poor neighborhoods of the capital, Athens. Apparently, and that's what we should be worried about, they place themselves against the political system. Indeed, um, a recent Eurobarometer poll uh, showed that in Greece, 91% of the people don't, don't trust political parties. In other words, they, they differentiate themselves in relation to the political system. The, um, the September 15 Greek elections uh, were held under haste, so that the society doesn't have the chance to see the effect of the bailout deal. Um, they were held under wide disappointment, confusion, uh, serious abstention. But, but the main point... And the main problem um, was that there were elections held under a climate of the fear of, uh, for the unknown. You know, there was, there was hard polarization. Left-wing voters uh, were being blackmailed uh, with the return of the same old corrupt political elites and decadent politicians. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't want this. And the polls, as we reported uh, last week, showed a tie between the first two parties. And whoever comes first governs. Because there's, there's this 50-seat bonus, if you remember, right. to, to the winner uh, under current um, electoral law. Some people really believe that maybe Tsipras could bring something new. And they don't see an alternative. An alternative. They, they, they didn't have the time to see an alternative. This popular unity party was, had an age of 20, 28 days. So... Let, Michael, let me ask you a question now. It, yeah. it, from my point of view, as I think you know, the big question here is Greece alone against 18 countries in the euro is a kamikaze mission, and it always was. Uh, Greece against 29 countries in the European Union is, is even worse. Do we have anybody, even editorial writers, even scholars who, who have this idea – that you're going to have to have an alliance of governments and work towards that, and you probably need an alliance of parties. In other words, a Syriza International or something like that, an anti-austerity 
anti draghi anti-European Central Bank. Has anybody figured out where they went wrong? Because in my view, that's where they went wrong. And by the time you got to the end of it, there was no alternative because they had failed to create it. And that would have meant going beyond this, what I can only call chauvinism. And it was the idea that a tiny country can put itself against these huge uh, conglomerates. Maybe you're right, but as, as I see it, the, the, the game is not uh, state against country against country, state against state. Uh, it's, um, it, the, the euro is not a, a, a tool of political domination country to country. It's, it's a social model. It, it's, an, um, it's imposing a social model, uh, a model for society. But in other so, words, a united front, a united front of countries and or parties, hopefully both, that would oppose that model and would propose something different. And that would have to be attractive to, you know, French voters, Italian voters, and maybe even some German voters as time goes on. Maybe, maybe. But there is no time for this. I don't think there's time for this. And the, well, the, the idea that po politics is... Uh, they're going to kick, to kick you out politically. I think this is wrong. Okay, see you next week, Michael. See you next Thank week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. It's our second hour. This is Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. Now, remember, the world historical people will be gathering in New York City on Sunday the 27th of September, 2 p.m. in the afternoon, Eastern Daylight Time, Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza, that is to say, East 47th Street by the United Nations, the Secretariat Building in sight, at least at one end of the park, as I recall, and you're going to be between 1st Avenue and 2nd Avenue. Lots of subway stops in the area. It's Midtown. This is uh, sort of East Midtown, Turtle Bay, what have you. Welcome to Putin, the peacemaker, uh, to stand up for dignity, historical continuity. If you want to thank the Russian people for their contribution to World War II, which was the decisive one. If you want to thank them for their contribution to saving the Union, the greatest friend Abraham Lincoln ever had, Tsar Alexander II of Russia. Then there are other, other examples, uh, Alexander I saved us from a new wave of British attacks at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. The British ruling class wanted to shift their forces back into North America and reconquer us. And they were prevented by Tsar Alexander I, who said, don't do that. And his armies were in Paris, and they might have, they might have been in London before anybody knew it. So uh, thank you to Russia and to Putin as a peacemaker. And he's trying to do a peacemaking operation now uh, against ISIS. The problem with ISIS is you've got to clobber them before you can make peace. But uh, that's eventually the goal is a political solution for Syria. So kick out those State Department lunatics and uh, thank you to Putin. So I'll be there. I look forward to meeting you, greeting you. Uh, 2 p.m. Sunday, Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza, New York City, 27th of, uh, of September. Now, um, let's, uh, well, we, I think we want to mention again that the, the right-wing Marxists comes from uh, Congressman Nunes of, uh, of California. He's a Republican head of the House Intelligence Committee. He's a friend of Boehner, and he says the Tea Party, the Freedom Caucus, are right-wing Marxists. So the right-wing Marxists are running wild on uh, Capitol Hill. We here are neither Marxist nor right-wing. Um, we want to mention, we want to say something, um, uh, some condolences for the victims of this terrible event, which has taken place in Saudi Arabia at Mecca, the stampede. Uh, you'll remember a week ago, it was the collapse of a, a construction crane of the Saudi bin Laden company. You've heard right. That's the bin Laden family firm. Right? This guy was the black sheep, but the other ones are still in charge. Uh, they were the ones who were spirited out of the U.S. after 9-11. Um, this is the, the Saudi bin Laden company, Crane Fell. That killed about 110 people. But this time it's much worse. It's one of these stampedes that take place, uh, unfortunately, with disturbing regularity. The, the Saudi royals are absolutely incompetent. 
They have no crowd control. They do not distribute police and troops uh, or militia in any recognizable way. There's no infrastructure. There's no guidance. Uh, and this happens repeatedly. In 1990, it was the death of over 1,400 pilgrims in a stampede. In 1994, it was 270 pilgrims uh, at the stoning of the devil point on the pilgrimage. In uh, 1998, 120 trampled to death. Uh, 2001, 35 trampled to death. Uh, 2003, uh, 14 dead. Uh, February 20, uh, 2004, 251 pilgrims killed. 2006, it was uh, 346 uh, killed. And this time, the low figure from Agence France Press is 700 dead. Consensus figure seems to be 1,300. Uh, Press TV is estimating 2,000 dead. If you want to hear my views about this in general, please look at tarpley.net. You will see there uh, an interview which I was uh, able to do with Press TV uh, this morning with another uh, gentleman on the line and an expert uh, precisely on this stuff. So uh, that's it. And this I haven't talked about the fires, right? They, the Saudis were happy to give you tents that were uh, flammable. Uh, 343, 343 pilgrims killed in 1997 because the tents were not yet uh, fireproof. Two dead uh, in 2011 in a fire. So uh, what kind of an administration is this? Well, it's the administration of the Saudi royal family, this conjuries of 2,000 or 3,000 uh, people with profound uh, cognitive problems, an absolute monarchy, worse than anything Europe ever, has ever seen, I think, since, maybe since Nero. But that's the idea. Um, the fingers are being pointed at Prince Salman for going by with his huge motorcade with a couple of hundred cops and a couple of hundred police and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, ar army guys going by. Uh, the Saudi health minister should have resigned, but he had the gall to come out and start blaming people from Chad people from other black African uh, countries. Niger and Chad were the ones he, he focused on. Some people from Pakistan killed, from Iran, from Morocco. Uh, our condolences. Uh, but the question is the accountability. Does this health minister resign? Will he be arrested? Will he be put on trial? Uh, what about criminal uh, liability? Uh, where do you go for that? And now I want to turn to Bernie Sanders. Yes, you, Bernie. Uh, you are on record, and the articles are all over Counterpunch. Bernie, you say you want the Saudis to run the Middle East. You want the Saudis to take over these other countries and impose something or other. You don't say what? Well, Bernie, now in the light of these tragic events with all those dead, do we learn anything from this? I say it shows that the benighted, backward, uh, absolute monarchy of Saudi Arabia is uh, is an abomination in the eyes of modern civilization, and their power should dwindle. It should not increase. They've got quite enough territory under their administration. Thank you very much. So, Bernie, tell us, uh, are you going to speak out against the Saudis ever? Uh, and I therefore turn also to Democrats. Haven't you learned anything? If a Democrat won't come out and make formal peace pledges and rule out loudly, repeatedly, categorically certain kinds of warmonger behavior, you're going to get a warmonger. You're lucky with Obama. It, it, it ended with Libya more or less uh, in that sense, um, partially because um, he was confronted by forces that he didn't want to mess with. Uh, and let's, let's also not forget Yemen. President Hadi of Yemen, right, the Saudi puppet, the bloody-handed butcher, uh, working for the Saudis. He had been holed up uh, taking refuge in Saudi Arabia because he couldn't stay in his own country because of his crimes. He's now back in Yemen, and he now says the end of the Houthis is coming soon. The Houthis will be eliminated, liquidated. Kill them all. That's what he's saying. So, Bernie, let's hear what you have to say about this. Uh, and I'm also wondering, uh, given the fact that so many of these people we're from Niger and Chad. Uh, Black Lives Matter. Do you uh, do you have anything to say about this? Do you have a foreign policy over at Black Lives Matter? I I would hope you would. It, it, I think it would be high time to condemn the Saudi government, right? And and if you're worried about the the establishment of the Democratic Party, and you're right to to be worried, 
this is a way to uh, to point this out. Now, let's uh, let's push ahead to President Xi because no.